So, okay, this is a good point. People are like, eh, it's not a good point. It's a, it's a question that even a lot of Americans are asking. Why do we give so much aid to Ukraine? And when we read news articles, you hear a dollar amount. And don't get me wrong, the U.S. Is, and Western Europe, but especially the U.S., is, is spending a significant amount of cold, hard cash. We are plugging gaps in Ukraine's uh, state budget, right? They have a, they have their federal budget, and if you want to mobilize soldiers for the war, you have to make cuts to things like social programs. And the fact is that a lot of those cuts, right, I say social programs, but you should think of it being like fire, water, uh, public utilities, electricity, um, you know, constructing and reconstructing shelters, hospitals. Those are the budgets that get cut. And so the U.S. has stepped in some on on for a while now and plugged those gaps in the budget to ensure that Ukraine can continue to afford to run both hospitals and keep training and putting troops on the front lines. But the largest portion of the aid is in military uh, hardware. And it's important to understand that this military hardware is really exists in two categories. Uh, the first is military hardware that is being cycled out of U.S. arsenals. So, for example, the Bradleys, the infantry fighting vehicles they received. And the news is probably listing them as, I don't know, let's say $500 million of equipment. And that's probably what the U.S. paid for those Bradleys on a per-unit basis. But those Bradleys are being cycled out of service. It's So it's sort of like saying, hey... Uh, I'm giving, you know, let's say you had a 2003 BMW and you, it, the thing had 200,000 miles and you said, you know what, I'm done with this thing. I have no plans on using it, but, uh, you know, my, uh, my, my nephew, he just turned 16 and uh, he needs a car. So I'm just going to give him this Mercedes. Now you could sit there and if you report like, like the journalist, the journalist would sit there and be like 16 year old nephew receives, you know, $80,000 Mercedes. And it's like, no, it's not. It was an $80,000 Mercedes in 2003 when you bought it, but now it's worth not much. Right. And that's how these Brad these Bradleys and much of this technology is. They're obsolete systems that have been updated um, while the U.S. still has Bradleys in its arsenal and its main uh, active duty and reserve forces. These are routinely cycled out of service. And so that's probably what we're looking at is some of these is technology or military hardware that was already slated to be uh, cycled off. And it may have been otherwise sold. Uh, it may have been, but most likely it was earmarked to get donated to allied nations anyway. So why not donate it to an allied nation that could really use it? So when you see these big numbers, it's for political reasons. And whether you want to stir outrage or you want to uh, show how much you're doing, um, it, it's a really good story and it sounds much better than US leftovers donated to Ukraine where they're put to good use, right? Um, but it's important to understand this is not as fiscally reckless as those sticker price numbers come out. The other thing that we're doing in Ukraine is we are running some combat trials. Don't kid yourself, some of this technology, especially like lethal drones, um, some of the fire control technologies, these are things that the US, they're not like bleeding edge, but they are systems that we have never tested in combat because they were developed when we were in Iraq and Afghanistan fighting counterinsurgencies. So uh, like, for example, I believe the HIMARS system. Um, let's see if we can find the HIMARS. It's an M142, right? The HIMARS has only been in service since 2010. And what's interesting is that this is a multiple rocket launcher, right? Um, and it was, you know, sort of tested, but we never threw rockets at Iraqi cities. Not in 2000. We did in 2003 in the initial invasion. But after that, there were never you know, the insurgents never had a battalion sized formation ever in one place. And so we simply never put the HIMARS into combat. We have no idea how it would perform. We have no combat data. In theory, it should be really useful. But only now do we have an opportunity to, to run combat trials on this system. And so, of course, why would you not give it to someone to try it out for you? And to our shock, I mean, not shock, but I think a little bit of a shock, the HIMARS is a, a, a very, very effective system. So what we sent it out, it, it, it there's not really a civilian analogy to running combat trials like this. Um, the best I can get, like, there's not, a, and, and so it's hard to say what is the value of learning how your weapons actually fight. And the answer is for a military, it's invaluable. There's some really, really prominent disasters in history. For example, the First World War, the British developed these uh, assist, these uh, boats. I think they called them, I think they were destroyers. Or they were a new type of cruiser, maybe. But they were like, they're fast and lightly armored. They'll be so fast, no ship can hit them. Well, the truth is, ships just aren't that fast. And they failed to realize that the technology to target a ship was had advanced way faster than their ability to make a ship nimble. So in some of their earliest encounters in the actual World War I, they realized that their new class of ship was garbage, just utter garbage. And it was a really stark wake-up call for the British. And if they had something like the war in Ukraine, where they could have run these new class of ship to their combat trials, they would have known immediately that this was a terrible investment, that they should absolutely pivot to a better, better armored, more powerful class of ship. So when you're like, how will Ukraine pay it off? It's like Ukraine is paying it off by using it. And remember, we're taking the biggest bully in Europe, Russia. And I say this without, it's not propaganda. This is, this is, this is how Russia behaves in Europe. They are coercive. Um, they, and Western Europe hates every deal they have to make with Russia because of how coercive and shitty they are. And the 
taking one of the biggest geopolitical rivals militarily. They're one of really only like three actual militaries in the world and obliterating them for a generation. That's what the Bradley was designed to do. That's what the M777 was designed to do, was to take major geopolitical rivals of the United States and shellack them. So when they're like, how will they pay it off? Bro, it is paid in full. Trust me on this.